Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Red Hot and Country podcast. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, coming to you from the small town of Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. And today we have a very uh, interesting interview. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and even though the reason why we're doing it today is a little uh, sad, because it has to do with the passing of a rockabilly great who's music I really enjoyed. Well, it's always a good time to talk to our guest today who's joining us from uh, L.A., from California. He's a singer, songwriter, guitarist, historian. I used to play his music a whole lot on my radio show in Nashville all those years ago. He's an excellent musician who has played all over America and all over the world. And I recently found out that he was close friends with Glenn Glenn, a great rockabilly singer from Missouri, who left us just a few days ago. So I asked him to guest on the podcast to talk a little about music, to talk a little about Glenn Glenn, and of course to talk a little about his own career. And joining us on the phone from Los Angeles is Deke Dickerson. Deke, thank you so much for answering my call today. You got it, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Now... Uh, I mentioned that Glenn Glenn was from Missouri, uh, and so were Big Joe Turner, Speedy West, Ronnie Self, on Oni Wheeler, Billy Swan, yourself. What is it about yeah. Missouri and, and, and country and rockabilly music? <laughs> well, you know, I think like a lot of southern states, and, uh, you know, Missouri really is a southern state, even though people call it a midwestern state. But, you know, all the southern states just had a big country music scene back in the day. There were lots of live shows. There were lots of radio stations. Uh, and there was just kind of a lot of opportunity for country singers. So, you know, when guys like Glenn Glenn or Porter Wagner, who was his, one of his cousins, by the way, uh, would pop up on the scene, there was, you know, there was things for them to do. And... Uh, when rock and roll came in, a lot of those country guys and those hillbilly guys started doing rockabilly music. And, uh, of course, then later on, I mean, there, there, there's just always been a, a lot of music in Missouri, and there still is. Well, before we began recording, I, I mentioned that I was born in Europe and that uh, rock and roll, early rock and roll, rockabilly, uh, country music, blues music meant a lot to me and uh, w were big influences in my life. Uh, what are your earliest musical memories, Deke? Well, you know, I was a really weird kid. I grew up in the 70s, but I hated the music that was current. I remember, you know, all, all my school kid friends were into uh, Led Zeppelin and Kiss or, you know, even worse, you know, soft rock like uh, the Osmonds or the DeFranco family or Sean Cassidy or that kind of stuff. And I just hated it. Even when I was a really young kid, five, six years old, I was like, what is this stuff? I hate it. Uh, and then when I finally heard, you know, 1950s music, uh, rock and roll and, and blues and doo-wop and country and all that, man, I was just like, this is it. This is, this is the stuff I like. Uh, so I was always a really weird young kid that was into all this vintage music. Well, well to me, it was the sound. It was it was the, uh, the the atmosphere of the music. It was also the energy of the music that really attracted me to those uh, early rockabillies and rock and roll singers, both white and black, even Latino, if you uh, count Richie Valens. And, uh, sure, yeah. but, 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 but what was it? What was it that attracted you to the music specifically? Was it the same thing? Or was it like a, 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 a something that allowed you for some sort of uh, self-expression? Yeah, I mean, I think it was all those things. Plus, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the kids in my school, I, I just kind of thought they were dumb. And, uh, and anything they liked must be dumb. And so when I discovered this kind of music, uh, it was it was all mine, you know. It, uh, I've often wondered if I had been around in the 50s and rockabilly and rock and roll was popular, if I would have liked it then or if I would have been a weirdo and <laughs> liked music from the 1920s or something, you know. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was, it was kind of neat because I was the only kid that liked all this stuff and I had it all to myself, you know. And it wasn't really until I moved out to, to California that I discovered that there was still a active scene for all this kind of music. 
did you uh, uh, move to uh, California? I believe it was in your early 20s. And uh, uh, was it because you were seeking a musical career at that point? I was, yeah, I, you know, I, I played music in Missouri, but I could tell that it was never going to work out as a career in Missouri. And when I came out to California on tour the very first time, I think I was 20 years old. And I just said, man, I got to live out here. This is this is paradise. And uh, it took me a couple of years. And I I met a, a girl out here in California, and she was really the reason why I just kind of left everything behind in Missouri and moved to, to California. Uh, so, you know, it was a lot of things. I moved out there for the girl who became my first wife and I used it, moved out here for the music career. And uh, I just I still like it. I'm still out here 30 years later. And uh, you did gravitate uh, to the guitar uh, early on. You could have chosen another instrument, but what, 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 was, what was it about the guitar that uh, attracted you so much? Because you're not just a guitarist, but you are a guitar expert. Uh, well, the funny thing is, my first instrument was actually the saxophone in the school band. And uh, mm -hmm. you'll appreciate this. The reason why I wanted to play the saxophone was because of Bill Haley and the Comet. <laughs> And uh, when I got into the school band, of course, you know, everything is just like practicing scales and the teacher, you know, I said, I told the teacher, I want to play like the guy in Bill Haley and the Comets. And then he just made fun of me. And, uh, and you know, man, I want to honk the saxophone. No, 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 that's not the proper technique. We do not honk the saxophone. Uh, so it was a very frustrating experience. And then a couple of years later, I remember seeing Chuck Berry on TV. You know, this would have been in the 1970s. It would have been one of his appearances on television in the 70s. And he started doing the duck walk. And I just said, well, that's it. I have to do that. How long until I can get a guitar? I need a guitar immediately so that I can do that. And I just kind of never looked back. Well, that's... uh. That, that sounds interesting because the other day, uh, Deke, I was rereading uh, Nick Kahn's book, Wa -ba 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 and he really yeah. trashes Bill Haley in that book. What is it about Bill Haley? Because, you know, he is one of the very first musicians that I ever heard and whose uh, uh, style I, I, I was drawn to because he was a little bit country, a little bit uh, blues, a little bit, of course, a lot of rock and roll at, at that time. Uh, but it also has some jazzy element to it. I, I've never understood this backlash against Bill Haley. Well, you know, I, I understand the backlash if you're coming from like a rocker perspective, because, you know, if you come, come from a perspective of thinking that, you know, Led Zeppelin is cool, it's really hard to wrap your head around a guy like Bill Haley. But if you come at it from the other direction, you know, the music from the 1930s and the 1940s, you know, like you were saying, jazz, blues and pop and, and all this different stuff. Man, you know, Bill Haley was really the guy that caught on very early that there was something happening with the teenagers and they wanted like a more hepped up, uh, faster, more aggressive version of jazz and, and blues and that sort of thing. And, and man, those records that he made in, you know, 1953, 1954, mm -hmm. 1955, before uh, Elvis became the biggest thing in America. They're just brilliant records. I mean, they're flawless records. And so I understand why people think, oh, you know, look, the guy was in his 30s. He was balding. He had the weird spit curl. You know, he wasn't a, a cool guy like Elvis or Gene Vincent. But, uh, man, those records are just unbeatable. I agree. Uh, Rock the Join, Rocking Chair on the Moon, some of those early ones. They're, they're really Western swing rockers that sound like, you know, early rock and roll. And, and that's where I can see the connection between the styles, between Western swing and rhythm and blues and, and rock and roll. And, and that's the reason why I value uh, Bill Haley so much. But, you know, we're not here to talk necessarily about Bill Haley, but as you can see, we can go in different directions. I suppose uh, when you got to uh, California, that, that must have been the right choice uh, for your musical career? Did you find um, soulmates there in the music world? Yes. Uh, you know, there was a big rockabilly scene happening in Los Angeles in the early 90s, and mm -hmm. there always has been a big scene out here. Uh, but back then, it was 
Big Sandy and the Fly Ride Trio and James Entfeld and Russell Scott and Rosie Flores. And uh, there was just a lot of bands playing all the time. And when I formed the Dave and Deke combo with Dave Stuckey, we were just playing all the time. And there was always gigs and people going to gigs and it was great. And I should also mention that, you know, the original 50s guys that were around Mm -hmm. they weren't that old then they were you know they were only in their late 40s early 50s and so they were still out playing a lot and uh, that's when i met glenn glenn and gary lambert uh they were super friendly and and very welcoming and uh just treated us like family you know you know those were the times when i was living in the northwest of spain and listening to those records and very soon i got my own radio show over there and that's the kind of music I was playing. Your records, the, the the records by Big Sandy and Rosie Flores and that kind of stuff, along with, of course, the uh, uh, older uh, classics from the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and on and on, you know. So yeah. uh, that really takes me back to a very happy period in my life from a, from, from a personal perspective. Uh, because, you know, uh, I remember records of yours like Hollywood Barn Dance, uh, you know, the records you, that, that, that came out on high tone, all of those ha- had um, distribution over in Europe. And so I was able to get those and, and listen to those. And I like to compare the different sounds and, and, and talk about it on the radio. So those those records were, were a big part of my uh, musical education. Um, nice. Is well, I'd like to hear that. Are, are there uh, an, a, any of those albums that you, that you remember uh, in, in a special way? Well, you know, for me, the the second Big Sandy album, when that came out, On The Go, it was just like, oh, wow, everything just got a lot more, like, the game got up, you know, we had to, we had to sort of play better, and we had to stand up straighter, and we had to sing better, and we had to put on a better show, because that album was just so good, you mm-hmm. know. And, uh, and they were such a frighteningly good band in those days, just well rehearsed and tight. And so that's the thing I really remember about moving to Southern California is that, you know, in, in Missouri, I had seen rockabilly bands and some of them were pretty good. But when I moved out to California, uh, you know, Big Sandy and those guys, and especially TK Smith, the guitar player, they just made me go, Oh, oh, wow. I, I have to get a lot better now don't i because these guys are are just smoking us you know well and you did get better because from what i remember from those records and i still listen to them they're really uh fantastic records what do you remember about those sessions for high tone because those are definitely my my favorite records of yours gotcha you were asking about david deke records not records no 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 i i was i was asking in in general but but since you 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 answered uh i think that kind of led me to to the next question which is you know of your own records uh, are there any in particular that you remember you know uh uh not not that you like better but that for whatever reason you remember uh particularly well sure well the making of hollywood barn dance was a fun record because we you know we decided that we the first record was done at wally's studio wally from big sandy and and he had a studio set up and you know it was quite primitive but he got a good sound out of it and then we decided for the second record that we wanted to try something a little different and so we we were actually able to record the record in uh the rehearsal place for this band social distortion which was an old recording studio uh in Orange County. And so it was a bigger room and Wally and a guy named Tim Mag brought in their equipment. And we basically just, you know, spent several weeks just trying to make, you know, the best record that we possibly could. And I remember, uh, you know, it was all live to mono tape. There were no overdubs. There was no mixing except just right on the fly when we were recording. And so we would have to do, tons and tons of takes to get the final take and and even now when i listen to those records i'm like well my guitar solo was better on the take before that but (laughs) this take is better overall you know so uh i always hear things that nobody else hears but you know in in retrospect that's it's a really great sounding record that hollywood barn dance and and i'm really proud of it do you do you feel like uh 
Roy Acuff, who used to think that, you know, the first take is always the best, or are you more of a perfectionist when it comes to recording? Um, a lot of times the first take definitely has the best energy, but, you know, it just kind of depends on how well rehearsed the band is mm -hmm. and how, uh, you know, how well everybody plays in the studio. And I'll tell you what, when you're recording live to tape, uh, it's a whole different energy because if, if you've got four or five guys in there, you're all looking at each other like, come on, man, don't mess up. <laughs> you know, if we mess up, we have to do this again. So there's just a lot more pressure on you to uh, to play better. Go back to the uh, 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 1990s. Uh, and you were on the on the West Coast, uh, just like back in the 40s. There was a West Coast uh, country music scene that didn't yeah. always uh, connect that much with the country music scene in Nashville. Uh, sometimes it did, but but often you know you had people who basically concentrated on playing on, on West Coast uh, studios sessions and uh, you know uh, TV shows like Town Hall Party and stuff like that, and they right. didn't do a lot of work in Nashville. Is that something that also happened in the 1990s when you were over there? Well, you know, when we moved, when I moved to California, the, the really cool thing was that so many of the West Coast people were still out here. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, Clippy, Clippy Stone was still promoting shows. Uh, Glenn Glenn and, and Gary Lambert were out playing shows. Uh, Rose Maddox and Fred Maddox would come to town occasionally and play, uh, you know, and, and there were others, too. My, my, my brain's not remembering all of them, but <laughs> there was just still a lot of that West Coast scene that was intact at that time. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, all those people have, have passed now. I think the only one that's really left is Larry Collins from the Collins Kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, that was another really exciting thing that happened to the Dave and D combo was when we got to back up the Collins Kids for their first reunion show. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that because I, I did have a little question about that since I really love the music of the of the Collins skits. How important do you think that Larry Collins was for the development of the, this kind of music? Well, you cannot overlook how important that the Town Hall Party television show was. You know, it was it was a sort of TV show that it's crazy to think about. It was live every Saturday night for something like three and a half or four hours. So just imagine having a TV show now that was, you know, <laughs> live every Saturday night for three or four hours. And so not only country people, but, you know, there was a lot of famous Hollywood type people that, that tuned into that show. And uh, that's how Joe Mathis wound up recording on a bunch of sessions, you know, that you never would have thought that he would have recorded on. Mm -hmm. Same with Merle, Merle Travis, because, uh, People saw them on Town Hall Party, and they, they thought, man, we got to get that guy on our, our record. And Johnny Bond was on know, there, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's another guy. Uh, you know, Johnny Bond goes way back to the 1930s, and he did so much stuff during his career. Uh, but that, that whole Town Hall Party time during the 1950s, it's a big part of it. But, you know, getting back to the Collins kids specifically, uh they don't really get the recognition that they deserve mm -hmm. for being basically the first rock and roll act on the West coast. And, and, you know, you might preface that by saying the first white rock and roll mm -hmm. act on the West coast, but I have a, a Hollywood bowl program from 1955, you know, which again is it's before Elvis broke. And, uh, it has the Collins kids listed as playing shake, rattle and roll and some other rock and roll song. And mm -hmm. I'm like, Holy crap, they were doing rock and roll songs on a country music show in Hollywood in 1955. I mean, people don't really give them that, that much credit for, for what they did, but those, those kids were bringing in that new sound. When you, uh, work with, uh, the, the Collins kids, were, were they, aware of the importance that their music had had or didn't they even think about that because i remember interviewing billy walker one time in nashville country singer mm -hmm. and he just said you know we're just recording these songs to make a buck we never thought that th this music would endure the the way that it has yeah well and and you know another thing that a lot of people don't realize about the collins kids is that 
<clears throat> after they quit making records, they qu- they kept playing in casino lounges, mm-hmm. you know, in, in Re- Reno and Tahoe and Las Vegas for years and years and years and years and years, well into the 1970s. And, you know, they changed with the times. They they played 60s music and they played 70s music. And, and so when the interest came back around for the Collins Kids 50s recordings, I know for a long time, Larry was just like, why, why would anybody want to hear that stuff again? <laughs> and no one could talk him into doing a, you know, a reunion show. I remember reading an interview where he said, well, maybe they could find a, a midget to go out and, uh, you know, play and, and we'll just call him Larry Collins or something. <laughs> but uh, it, eventually the Hemsby guy, uh, Willie Jeffries, convinced Larry to reunite with Lori and come over and do a show. And I, you know, I don't know how he talked them into doing it. And Dave and Deke rehearsed with them, you know, before they did the show. And you can tell they just had no idea about the rockabilly scene at that time or, you know, how, how beloved they were. They were just like, well, somebody's paying us a bunch of money to go to England and do this reunion show. So I guess we'll do it. But then when we got over there, it was like Beatlemania. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never, as long as I've been playing, I've never been a part of a show that was as well received as the Collins Kids' first reunion show. It was five thousand people just screaming. You could just feel just these waves of energy coming off of the audience. Mm-hmm. And you know, we did three or four encores, and it was, you know, it was one of the greatest things I've ever been associated with. And I, and I think that at that time suddenly Larry and Lori knew how important their 1950s mm-hmm. records were. Cause there, there were all these European rockabilly fans that were, that knew every single word to every song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I would have been one of those if I had been there. I wasn't there at that point anymore. I don't think, but, <laughs> but I would have been one of those, I, I, you know, at this point I wanted to direct the audience to the Collins kids records that have been reissued on CD by, Labels like Bear Family, and uh, also there are some great clips of them and uh, other musicians on Town Hall Party, which, as you said before, was an amazing TV show. I, I, I miss live music on the TV, to tell you the truth, Deke. And uh, one of yeah. the things that I love about uh, old shows like uh, Town Hall Party in particular is how casual they were, how good uh, musically they were, and then also the interviews that uh, would be interspersed here and there. Uh, why don't we have live music shows on TV anymore? Don't, don't they sell anymore? Well, you know, I guess you could call things like uh, The Voice or, you know, those kind of shows, America's Got Talent or whatever. I guess you could call those live music shows. It's, oh, you it's know we're not what, talking about those. <laughs> what passes for, for a live music show in, in the modern era. But, uh, yeah, it, it's not the same. We know that. Now, what you mentioned about Europe uh, is interesting because um, you've played throughout the world and you you mentioned how well uh, the music of the Collins Kids and your own music was received in, in, in Europe. Um, is it received differently overseas? And, and if so, why do you think it is so well liked over there? Well, you know, the funny thing about American audiences is that we have invented a lot of cultural things over the years, you know, music and, and, you know, movies Mm -hmm. and just the list, the list goes on and on, but it's also a very fickle audience where, you know, we'll invent something incredibly great, like rock and roll. And then a few years later, we're like, yeah, let's just throw that in the trash. because now we're into this, you know, uh, everything is very disposable. It seems like Mm -hmm. in America. And, uh, the thing that's different about Europe is that, you know, when these reissues came out in in Europe, people really, you know, became much more educated on music of the past than Americans were about their own music. So when you go to play any of these European festivals, they know all these songs and they have, they own all these records and they know the history behind it. And it's just a different 
culture than what we have over here. And uh, I've always been sort of mystified why America is like that, but it just is. Well, having been the one who was born in Europe and who actually learned a lot of English, not in a classroom, although I did have English classes at school, of course, but from listening to country and rockabilly and Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and American music, you know, it all started with the Beatles for me, but the Beatles opened a world of music that came before them and that shaped the music that they made, and that's how I got to rockabilly and country and jazz and, and, and rhythm and blues and, 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 and all of that. So I, I do feel myself a little bit... Um, I kind of identify with a little bit of what you of what you say because uh you know my 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 musical culture mostly comes from um America and I was very surprised to get to Nashville in in the early 2000s and realize that almost no stations were playing the old classics and that's when I began doing a, a radio show playing that kind of music on on WRVU uh, which is a station that doesn't exist anymore unfortunately um uh, and, you know, going back to, to what you mentioned before, uh, you mentioned that it was around that time in the, uh, when you moved to California that you met people like, you know, the Collins Kids and Glenn Glenn. So uh, Glenn Glenn made some fine records uh, throughout the 1950s and early 60s. And later on, he came back and made some more in the 70s. Uh, Everybody's Moving, songs like uh, One Cup of Coffee, and several others, uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have heard that uh, just a few days ago, uh, this same month of March 2022, that we're recording this conversation with Deke Dickerson, Glenn Glenn passed away at the age of 87. He was from Joplin, Missouri. And my question to you, Deke, is, is when and how did you meet Glenn Glenn, and, and what do you remember about meeting him after, of course, knowing his music beforehand? Well, you know, when I was in Missouri, I was into rockabilly music, and I owned a lot of rockabilly reissues and compilations and things like that. And so, of course, you know, one of the first things you hear is Everybody's Moving by Glenn Glenn. It's just one of the great records. And so I already had this impression in my mind of Glenn Glenn, the rockabilly star. And uh, I remember... It wasn't very long after I moved out to California that I got invited to a backyard party at uh, this guy's house in Orange County named Jake the Barber. And, uh, that's a whole other story. He's, he's no longer with us. But Jake organized his backyard party, and, and we showed up, and Glenn Glenn and Gary Lambert were there. And, and I was freaking out because it's like, wow, he's, it's Glenn Glenn. Oh, my God. And, uh, and then... As we hung out with them and, and talked to them, we realized that, you know, these guys were music fans of the same music, the same way that we were. And they were excited about the same thing that we were. And, and, you know, they told us stories about getting to hang out with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash and uh, the Maddox Brothers and Rose and just all these people that we idolized. And so it was really cool. It was more like meeting uh old friends who mm -hmm. were into the same things than it was like meeting big rock stars or something. Mm -hmm. and, and you actually seem to have quite a bit in common with him because you're also from Missouri. Uh, That's right, and, yeah. And, and you moved to California just like he did. He moved to California as well. Uh, That's do, right, yeah. Do you know what it was that attracted Glenn to California? Was it a family thing or was he moving there to, uh, you know, uh, seek a recording career? Well, he definitely did not move out there for a recording career. I can't remember exactly the reason why he moved out, but, you know, especially after World War II, a lot of people moved uh, to California just because there were so many jobs. Uh, now, going back to the 1930s, a lot of people fled places like Oklahoma and Texas mm -hmm. and, uh, and Arkansas and Missouri because... They were super poor, and you know the Dust Bowl was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, his family moved out after World War II, and so much of that after World War II migration happened because there was just a ton of jobs in California. And uh, I know that Glenn, after he got out of the army, he got a job with uh, General Dynamics, 
and work there until he retired, you know? So the, the California dream definitely worked out for him, even though the music thing didn't work out. Didn't the army have something to do with the fact that his music career didn't pan out because he actually had to go into the army at a crucial point in his career? Yeah, if I remember the story correctly, uh, he heard his record being played on the radio while he was in the uh, army barracks and he told people it was him and nobody would, would believe him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there was no way for him to promote the record, so... Well, Everybody's Moving is, uh, as you said, the first song that you probably heard of Glenn Glenn's, and it's also the first one I heard from 1958. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, Deke, but in many ways the, 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 the sound, uh, the mood of this record is, is quite different from other rockabilly uh, recordings at the time. It's kind of like a more haunting sort of sound, um that that than other you know rockabilly outings that that were recorded uh, around that time period yeah and uh you know it's funny because california has always been a more sort of laid back kind of relaxed place and you definitely get that feeling listening to that record it's like it rocks but it has <laughs> this like uh like you were saying like a a uh, slower, kind of haunting sort of sound to it. What would you say about uh, Gary Lambert's guitar playing? How, how important is Gary Lambert's guitar to the uh, overall sound of uh, Glenn's music? Well, you can't get away from the fact that uh, all those 1950s recordings was, a, it was really a duo. It was Glenn and Gary. I mm -hmm. know that the records came out uh, with Glenn's name on them. But uh, when those guys started playing music, it was Glenn and Gary. And, you know, when he got signed, it was Glenn and Gary. And, you know, they did all of their shows as Glenn and Gary. It's just that the records came out as Glenn Glenn. It's just that uh, whenever I hear uh, his music, I, I hear something somewhat different in, in the guitar sound. And I don't know if this is, obviously, I don't know how to play the guitar. I'm, I'm not... Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have any any, any technical <laughs> explanation for anything uh, regarding music, but uh, except for how I feel when I listen to something, and I feel like uh, there's something to his guitar playing that's I wouldn't say unique, but but definitely very different. Well, the one thing I can tell you about uh, Gary Lambert is that you know he was an original guitar geek. Uh, when I met him and started talking to him. It, it blew me away because I realized, wow, this guy was just like me, but he was doing it in the 1950s. And so he was obsessed with Merle Travis and mm. he was obsessed with Chet Atkins and he was obsessed with Scotty Moore. And, you know, back in the 1950s, this was a really difficult thing to do. He got a, a Standell amplifier like Merle Travis. He mm. got an Echo Sonic amplifier like Scotty Moore. He, uh, you know, had really, really nice custom guitars and so he he was really really dedicated to this whole country guitar thing and i think the thing that maybe is unique about him is i can't think of any other teenagers that were doing that it was mostly old men so he was kind of playing this uh old man kind of guitar but he was a teenager and he brought some of that uh, that teenager youthful energy to that type of playing mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, besides the uh, army intervening, uh, do, do you have any theory as to why uh, Glenn Glenn's career didn't pan out? Do you think it has to do with the fact that the music changed when he came back from the army? Yeah, plus, you know, the thing about Glenn is that uh, he made these fantastic records, but he never had proper management. He never had a record label that was really pushing him. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you look back at the history of the records that we love, we don't really think about it because all we're thinking about is the music. Mm -hmm. But the records that became hit records, they always had some huge manager or, uh, you know, a, a somebody promoting it. Mm -hmm. And Glenn never, Glenn never had that, you know like with Elvis and Colonel Tom Parker or uh, Gene Vincent and Sheriff Tex Davis or, you know, there's behind every big hit record, there's always some guy with a big cigar in his mouth who's taking 
most of the money, <laughs> but you know, he's, he's the reason why that record became a hit, you know, and, and Glenn just never had that. Yeah. Well, I suppose that after you met him, uh, that backyard party that you mentioned before you must've kept, uh, up with him over the years. Did you, uh, play with him much or, or. Yeah, I played with him a bunch of times, uh, usually on upright bass, uh, -huh. uh because, you know, they would, book these gigs and then they would need a rhythm section and so uh myself and sometimes my echophonic drummer brian neville we'd go out and play gigs with them and um i can't even tell you the number of times that we either played with them or hung out with them or saw them at a show or something like that it was just like they were they were always around you know and that's why it's weird to think that both glenn and gary are gone what do you um remember the most or what things do you remember the most about Glenn Glenn and as 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 a man and and as a musician uh from all these years that that you've known him if I were to ask you what are the things that that you think of when you think of Glenn Glenn beyond the music I just always remember him as being a really really excited enthusiastic music fan And I think that, uh, you know, we've, we've had so many people that are, uh, cynical and burnt out and, uh, feel like they got ripped off. And, and, uh, there's just, you know, and when you back up a lot of the older artists, there's an awful lot of them that just carry around, uh, a very bad feeling, you know, and even though Glenn never made any money doing it, the thing that I loved the most about him was he just was always excited about music. You know, he was excited about us young guys, like my band and, and uh, big Sandy and those guys, he was excited when he would talk about his honky tonk heroes, you know, like Lefty Frizzell or, or Merle Travis or any of those kind of guys. And uh, he was just always really excited. And, and I missed that because he would get, He would get people excited around him. I suppose that even though he he had to settle for a regular job, uh, he must have kept playing music even before you met him. Uh, say that one more time, even though he had a regular job. Uh, I, I'm sure he uh, kept uh, playing music uh, even before you met him. Did he? Did he? Did he play? Uh, you know, throughout the 1970s, throughout the 80s, before you met him, or or did he just retire for a bit and then came back on the scene? Well, you know, I think he played a little bit, but not much. Um, Gary Lambert kept playing with various country bands. Uh, Gary was a postman, and uh, so you know he he would work a lot at night and then get up early and deliver the mail and. Uh, I know that Gary kept playing guitar a lot, but I don't think Glenn played very much throughout the late 60s and throughout the 1970s. But when the whole sort of straight cats rockabilly revival thing happened in the early 1980s, then the, uh, the European festival guys started coming around wanting him to play again. And, and I know that they, they went over and they played festivals and they made some new records and things like that. And then once Once they started doing that, then they just kept playing these uh, rockabilly shows and, and did so until, uh, you know, he couldn't perform anymore because of the Alzheimer's. You're listening to a new episode of Red Hot and Country. My name is uh, Anton Garcia Fernandez, talking to you from Jackson, Tennessee, and over in uh, Los Angeles, California. We're talking today with our guest, Deke Dickerson. We're talking about many things, and among them, the passing of the great rockabilly artist, Glenn Glenn, who was a good friend of Deke's, and I appreciate the time that Deke is putting into our conversation today, and as we are winding down the conversation, I have a couple more questions for you, Deke, and then I promise I'll let you go. I know you got other things to do today. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, you were talking about, you mentioned the Stray Cats just now, and, you know, that made me think about the fact that If you think about it, Rockabilly's uh, popularity in the 1950s was rather short-lived, uh, in some cases reduced to uh, certain regions of uh, the country, but its influence on music at large has been really uh, long-lasting, uh, you know, through the Beatles, uh, then the revival in the 70s, punk rock, heavily influenced by 
uh, rockabilly. How can you explain the long-lasting influence, musical influence of this uh, style that we know as rockabilly music? Well, I think that it's, you know, you can call it a simple music, and it is a simple music, but I think that that's also, uh, it, it's not recognizing the best part about it, and that is that sometimes things that are simple are the most effective. And I always use this example that, you know, you can play Johnny Cash in a bar room in any place in America and people will go, yeah, we love that. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can play Johnny Cash in any bar room in Europe, in Russia, in Australia, in Japan, anywhere you go in the entire world and people respond. It's like, yeah. And I think that's the deal is that there's just something about this simple music that connects with people at a very gut level. It just kind of hits them right in the middle of the chest and, and they understand it. And I think that that's why rockabilly will have a big audience 200, 300 years from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, uh, since you mentioned, you know, Russia and Japan and, and Europe and different places like that, it, it is interesting to me that, uh, Regardless of uh, language, the music is uh, popular and is appealing. So, you know, uh, it's, it's a kind of music that kind of appeals to your senses and it appeals to, to your feelings without the necessity of really understanding what go, cat, go means, right? Right, yeah, it's true. And, and you know, I, I've played places all over the world, uh, you know, Latvia and Estonia and... Mm -hmm. You know, places where they really don't speak English very well at all, uh, France, you know, and it doesn't matter because they just respond to the, the feeling and the music. Do you think there's more of a um, academicist sort of approach to the music over there than there is here in the U.S.? Um, I don't know if academic is the right word or if maybe just sort of reverential, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I, I love those Swedish bands like Wildfire Willie and those guys, uh, but it's it's also an approach that we just don't take in America because we would I don't know it, it's just a you know they they approach it like okay we are going to play this show like it was August seventh nineteen fifty six mm -hmm. and you know every every aspect is going to be completely authentic from you know the microphones to the guitars and and our clothes and our hair and everything. And I watched some of those bands and I'm like, wow, this is really freaking awesome that they can do this. I mean, I think you have to be not a part of American culture in order to reproduce American culture that well. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, I understand uh, completely. And so it's just a different thing here, you know, and, and I think about a guy like uh, um, Sonny from the Planet Rockers. Now, you know, Sonny looks like a freak. You know, he does not look like an authentic <laughs> 1950s rockabilly guy. He's, he looks like a modern-day crazy hillbilly because that's what he is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when he starts singing, man, it's, it's the real deal. Like, there you go. That's, that's like a real rockabilly singer. Singing right now in 2022, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But he does. He doesn't dress in authentic 1956 clothes. He doesn't, you know, style his hair like an authentic 1956 rockabilly. Uh, he's just part of modern American culture. But when he opens his mouth and starts singing a rockabilly song, it's like, wow, there it is. That's mm -hmm. there's the sound. Well, what I like about so, you, you know, I, I'll just finish by saying I. I there's great aspects to both things. You know what I mean? I, I love going to see a band like Jack Baymore and the band. It's I, I love going to see the planet rockers. I think there's great aspects about both of them. It's just different. Well, what I, what I was going to say is that what I love about your music is that, uh, you know, it, it's very clear when you listen to it, that you have a deep knowledge of, of, of the, of the tradition of the music, but you do bring it into the press and you do try to modernize it a little bit and put your own touch to it. And I think that's, uh, something that really has always appealed to me about the records that you have made, 
personally. Um, and so I wonder, you know, in what ways do you think music of the past, like rockabilly, like honky tonk, like early blues, in what ways does it speak to us listeners in the 21st century or to younger generations even than than we are? But, uh, well, <laughs> you're going to have to dissect that question just a little bit because that's a lot to answer in one question. <laughs> let's start over at the beginning. And just uh, before we get into seven or eight layers, let's kind of take it piece by piece. Well, the, the uh, basically, uh, what is it about music of the past? That would be an, an easier way to, to put the question. What is it about okay. music of the past that... That 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 speaks to people in the present because it's music that was not made for the present, but it does say something to people decades after it was recorded or produced. Well, my answer is going to be different than what everybody else might tell you. Uh, some people might say nostalgia. Some people might say you know yearning for a simpler time, whatever. But I I honestly think that certain people's brains are just wired that way hmm. and i think about i think about the way that you know i hated modern music when i was five or six years old i mean i'm a five or six year old kid I, how do you even come to that conclusion you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh and when i heard 50s music i realized this is what i like um and so i think that for a lot of the other thing that i will point out is <laughs> You can go on YouTube and look up the most horrible music ever made, and there will be somebody in the comments that says, "This is the greatest music ever made. I wish they made music like this still. You know, this was the golden era of music, and you know, it might be something like Pablo Cruz or or Journey or something like that. And you're thinking, no, this is the worst music ever made. So. So I think it's just how your individual brains are wired. And it, it certainly seems like, you know, most of the people that I've met in the rockabilly scene, you know, their brains are just wired that way. You know, they're, they're not going to like anything else. And it's probably the same when they have uh, 70s disco party uh, festivals, where, you know, wherever that may be. They're all getting together and talking about how great 70s disco is. So. That, that's my that's my guess on it. I, I like that answer for sure, because uh, uh, I, I I do agree with that, and I I think a lot about that that kind of thing, and, and why is it that things that you didn't like years ago now you like? Uh, you know, it happened to me with certain Miles Davis albums, for example, that I hated as a teenager, but now I think they're great. Yeah. But anyway, final question, Deke, and I'll let you go. Uh, can't uh, not mention this. Uh, because you're now working on the biography of one of my favorite musicians of all time, and that's Mr. Merle Travis. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that project, how it came about, uh, when it's coming out, because I can't wait to read it. Well, I can't wait to read it either. It's had a lot <laughs> of uh, delays because of the, the COVID thing. It should have been out of two years ago, but uh, I'll just tell you how it came about. Is basically just realized how come Merle Travis does not have a book out? It, it doesn't make any sense. You know, here's a guy that was in the country music hall of fame. He was a very influential guitar player. He wrote these classic American songs and there's no book about the guy. And, and what made it even weirder is that Merle was a really good writer. You know, of all mm -hmm. the country music people, mm -hmm. he was probably the best writer, you know? So it, it made no sense that, no book existed and funny too uh, uh natural born yeah. gambling man like my chicken yeah. fine size and all of those songs very very clever guy and um i met his two daughters out here in southern california merlene and cindy and i just said look there's got to be a book i want to write the book and it took a year or two of trying to convince them and finally uh they let me into the storage unit where they have all of Merle's things that he had when he died. And what we discovered was, was pretty amazing that he had started writing an autobiography, mm. but had, he had never finished it. And it was really raw. You know, there was about a hundred pages of autobiographical writing, but uh, there was nothing after 1955. And uh, it was very, very incomplete. So I just said, look, let me, 
let me take this and approach a publisher and see if I can get us a book deal. And I did. I, I got us a book deal through BNG Books, uh, who have been publishing a lot of really fabulous country music books. And from there, it, man, it was three years of my life of researching and, and writing. And then after basically having the thing done, researching some more, <laughs> editing some more, uh, it, it, you know, the, the whole thing was just a really, really long process, and uh, it's done now. So just waiting for the publisher to put it out. Well, I'm really <clears throat> waiting for that as well, uh, because Merle Travis was also one of the very first country music musicians I ever heard. Uh, and I remember um, they were mostly re-recordings of his classics, and it took me a while right. to actually fi find the originals, which are far superior, as, as you can imagine. Um, and well, of course, there's their, that song from the family box set that came out in the '90s. That was actually the reason that I had bought a CD player. Mm. Was uh, it's like, oh, I don't want CDs. I hate CDs. And then, oh, there's a Merle Travis <laughs> box set. I guess I have to buy a CD player. It's such a great box set. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about the Bear Family one. That's what. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one I'm talking about too. And 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 I remember just having a, a an old CD that just had re-recordings. That's how I first heard Merle Travis. Uh, but then I found that Songs from the Hills album that Bear Family put out, and that uh, obviously led me to uh, getting the whole box set, which I recommend to everyone, as I am already recommending to everyone out there this book by Deke Dickerson. Hopefully, uh, it'll come out uh, soon. Uh, and I, I'm sure, you know, knowing you, I, I mean, I, 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 this is the first time I talked to you, but I followed your music and your in your career over the years. I'm sure you talk a whole lot about the music. Talk a, a lot about everything. It's going to be 480 pages. Uh, so it, there's a lot about the music. There's a lot about the guitar playing. There's a lot about, uh, you know, Merle's personal life. He was, he was a really genius guy. And, you know, the things that he did, he did better than anybody else. But he also had a, a really rough life, a lot of uh, problems with alcohol. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, was married uh <laughs> at least five times that we know about. And um, so it was a very interesting story to tell because the guy was so good at the things he was good at and uh, and yet had this very destructive, self-destructive personality. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that, Deke. And, um, of course, I'm sure a lot of people that will be listening to this will already know who you are, but for those who may not, uh, where can we find <coughs> information about Deke Dickerson, you know, tour dates and where to get the records and that kind of thing? Uh, well, first of all, you know, just in case we have any Spanish speaking uh, listeners out there, it is pronounced Deke in America, but it's spelled D-E-K-E. -E. Uh, when I go to Spain, everybody calls me Decade, and that's fine. <laughs> Uh, because they, they told me what Deke means in Spanish, and uh, that you know that's not really what it's supposed to mean uh, <laughs> over here. So, so we leave it at that. Just, just want to check out my social media or my website. It's just D E K E, and then Dickerson, uh, Deke Dickerson dot com, or uh, you know I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. You know, to finish, I'll tell you, uh, Deke, that uh, when I first uh, saw a record of yours on a uh, rack uh, in a in a uh, record store in uh, Vigo, Spain, in the northwest of Spain. Uh, I thought, is this guy related to Dub Dickerson? Uh, I've been asked that a bunch over the years. <laughs> I didn't want to ask you that because I know the answer is no. <laughs> but I just <laughs> there you are. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> that was the first thing I, I, I thought. And then when I listened to the music, I thought, hey, maybe it is possible. Then I found out the answer was no. Yeah. Deke Dickerson. Well, you know, <laughs> Doug, Doug, Doug Dickerson was known as the, uh, the man with a million friends. And uh, I've got at least 10 friends. So you know, I, I consider myself lucky. <laughs> the, the, the guy with the grin in his voice is what they called him, right? He sang all those that's right, songs. That's right. Count me in. Right. and. You know, great, great honky tonk music from the fifties that not a lot of people remember, but I know you do, and that's why I brought that up to finish the uh, interview today. It's been a huge pleasure, uh, pleasure, Deke, to to have you here on the show, uh, Red Hot and Country, and uh, you know, thank you so much for your time, for your music, for all your writing. 
Uh, and thank you also for uh, helping us uh, remember the figure, the music, and the career of the great, late Glenn Glenn. Thanks for having me on your show, Anton, and uh, anytime. Let's do it again. Well, when you put out that book, you can be sure I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call again. And if you want to do it again, uh, you know, you're perpetually invited on here. Okay, well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Deeg Dickerson has been our guest uh, today on Red Hot and Country. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, coming to you from Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America. And this uh, episode will be heard very soon on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Check out the records by Deke Dickerson. Check out his website, DekeDickerson.com, D-E-K-E Dickerson.com. And, of course, make sure to keep on listening to the very best in classic country music. And as the great Chris Christopherson once said, if it sounds country, that's what it is. Don't think about it too much. Thank you. And so long, everybody.